Hello and welcome back to Safety for Cruisers. It's been a long time since our last video, but uh, now we're coming to you from uh, the beautiful Tumoto Islands in French Polynesia. We are currently in Harifa, which is a really nice anchorage in uh, Fakarava, uh, right in the middle of the atoll. So, uh, my name's Eitan, and today we are going to be talking about anchoring. I actually have to have notes because this is going to be a longer video potentially. So uh, we're going to start out talking about equipment and then we're going to go through some basic intermediate and advanced techniques and finish off talking about storm anchoring and med mooring. So to start out with uh, equipment. So obviously we're talking about anchoring, uh, kind of showstopper is the anchor. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, types of anchors and uh, which one you choose is going to depend on your boat. Uh, some boats can only take certain types of anchors, uh, and it's also going to depend on uh, what you do with that boat. So if you're just doing occasional bay cruises on a smaller sailboat or a powerboat, uh, you might just have a small anchor that stows easily in a lazarette that you don't need to have a lot of chain on because you don't do a lot of anchoring, you're mostly going dockside. Uh, but if you're like us and uh, you're out cruising and there's no docks, no moorings, no nothing, and you're going to be on the hook for the majority of your time, the anchor is going to uh, kind of take a uh, more important role. And for us, the uh, selection we made was a Rockna. Uh, don't get sponsored by Rockna or any of the other brands that uh, we talk about, but for us, uh, our Rockna 15 kilogram uh, is going to be uh, what we went with, and uh, so far I have absolutely zero regrets. I absolutely love it. It sets in no time, it holds, and uh, it fits well on our bow roller, so that's uh, been a great choice for us. A lot of other boats do use Rockna, uh, but again, whichever one you go with is going to depend on uh, your vessel. Along with that, not only the uh, type of anchor you go with, but the weight of that anchor is also going to be dictated by your boat. So as a general rule of thumb, uh, as to the limits of practicality, heavier is better for anchors. So if you're gonna be, if you're on the fence between two sizes and your windlass can handle the load of the extra one and it's reasonable for you to handle that anchor, I would go with the step up there because that means uh, a little bit more security, potential to be able to get away with a little bit less scope uh, out, which we're gonna talk about, um, and just a little bit more peace of mind when you are on the hook. So just downstream of the anchor is going to be the swivel. Uh, I'm sure there are people that are gonna argue that you don't wanna have a swivel on a chain, but uh, I'd say that the vast majority of, uh, of people out there have swivels built into their uh, road setup. So there's uh, again, a bunch of different kinds and uh, the one that you select is going to have to match up with your anchor, your chain, and we found out your bow roller. So uh, we started out with uh, a Lumar swivel. It's a really nice, flush, sexy swivel that uh, Lumar makes. And uh, we had that on for uh, the first year or so of cruising and for years before that at the dock. Uh, but eventually decided that we were going to switch it up and go with the Mantis uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of them is the uh, Lumar has the potential to have some issue with side loading. Um, and uh, also just like the uh, the design on the on the Mantis, so we upgraded that. But we found out that our anchor roller uh, worked worked really well for our nice smooth uh, kind of inline trim uh, Lumar swivel. Didn't handle the uh, Mantis swivel, uh, so a little bit more bulky as well. Uh, so we had to do some modification there. So keep that in mind when you're choosing your gear, uh, is that it has to work with uh, everything you have on your boat. So. Uh, Again, we went with the uh, the Mantis. It's uh, super heavy duty. Uh, it can pretty much lift the boat from the swivel. Um, and uh, one of the features that, uh, essentially the only feature that drew me to it from the Lumar was that it has a built-in uh, stainless uh, shackle that actually makes the connection to the anchor. So that allows for your entire road to pivot directly off the anchor and it greatly reduces the risk of any kind of side loading uh, weakening your swivel if you have any big swings or any big pivots while you're on the hook. So downstream from the swivel, next thing is going to be the uh, chain, hopefully, uh, or your road, your anchor road. So uh, just like with the anchor, how uh, 
a little bit heavier is generally better. If it's practical, seam is going to go for the amount and for the size of your chain. So the, and again, this is dependent on the type of cruising you're doing. Again, if you're on a, a little boat in a bay and you're not doing a lot of anchor, you can get away with five feet of chain on your main anchor possibly. Uh, or if you're on a go fast uh, boat that only gives you a tiny little anchor and doesn't have any kind of chain locker to speak of, then you get what you get. But again, if you're on a uh, cruising boat or a bigger sailboat or a bigger motor yacht, uh, you're gonna have some room to play around and you're gonna be able to select how long. And uh, if you're going to be resizing your windlass, you'll be able to select the diameter of your chain. So uh, we're not gonna get into the stainless for us galvanized G3, G4, different types of, uh, of chain and steel. That's gonna be a whole video that I'm probably never gonna do because I'll let somebody else have that fun. Um, but again, longer is going to be better in terms of how much chain you have, and uh, heavier is going to be better. So uh, for us, uh, we have 300 feet of, uh, of all chain. Uh, a lot of boats, uh, especially, uh, I'm gonna single out production cats because uh, they are cruisable, but they do not come cruiser ready. Uh, a lot of boats will have 100, 150 feet of chain, and then it'll be a three strand splice uh, or a potentially a mega raid spr uh, splice onto another 150, 200, however long of, uh, of nylon road. Um, I'm not going to be so diplomatic as to say there's nothing wrong with that. I think there's a lot wrong with that, uh, especially if you've only got 100 feet of chain, uh, because one, 100 feet of chain we're going to get into scopes is uh, not going to necessarily be enough for a lot of people depending on the depth of your anchorages in those areas and also uh, splices are just an absolute nightmare to utilize with a windlass. Windlasses are designed that they can take both, uh, both rope and chain roads and uh, they do that very well uh, but the, they do not handle the junction between the chain and the rope. So dropping, not necessarily a problem. You could have the chain skip out and then the road is gonna uh, drop super fast because the uh, the cam uh, essentially is just a groove that the, uh, that the rope then has to uh, go into and get friction locked against the uh, windlass drum is, you could potentially skip out of that. But the bigger trouble is if you are pulling anchor and the windlass can't make the transition from the rope back to the chain. Uh, had that happen on a handful of boats, uh, depending on how heavy the chain is and how well the windlass is set up, uh, that transition can be a real nightmare. So uh, if at all possible, I would say have at least as much chain as you're going to normally use. If you're in the Bahamas and you're on a small boat and you only are gonna need to put out 60 to 100 feet of chain, that's great, you might only need that. But if you're going to be going to a variety of places or you're going to be going to places with deeper anchorages, if possible, just get a solid chain rope. Um, I think 300 feet is a pretty normal amount uh, and is a pretty good amount. Uh, I've, I've been in one anchorage where I wish I had more chain than 300, uh, but for the vast majority of the time, it is plenty. Uh, go out on limbs, go so far as to say that if you are looking for needing more than 300 feet of chain maybe you should be anchoring somewhere else so like i said more chain is better and heavier is better if you have to go with the road go with it but uh try to have that be for essentially like your backup room so whatever you normally use have that as chain and uh so you hopefully never have to go over that splice and onto the road uh, with the uh, with the chain, we'll talk really quickly about marking it. Uh, a lot of new boats are coming with chain counters, which are great, but like everything electronic, they are uh, a little bit finicky and they need to be recalibrated, and it's just one more thing to uh, rely on as a potential uh, failure. So, uh, most people uh, physically mark their chain. So we've done a bunch of different things. Currently, uh, we have these uh, pieces of webbing that are zip tied onto the chain with a number written on it. Uh, there is a standard color code uh, with an acronym that does not bear repeating on YouTube uh, that you can look up, uh, but different colors are relatively standardized to correspond to different lengths. So R90 is blue, as is most people's 90. Um, 
you need to keep an eye on those markers. If you choose to use something like webbing, they have uh, kind of commercial nylon laminated ones that uh, you can also use the zip tie on. Um, they have little colored blocks that insert into the chain. You can use that. Some people paint the chain. Some people uh, run colored line through the chain. There's a million different ways. All of them are going to suffer from the same issues, which is that it's an incredibly abusive environment that they're living in. They're on a piece of metal or a piece of rope that is going in and out of a locker around a windlass, getting dragged along the bottom on rock, sand, whatever you're in. So you need to keep an eye on your markers and you need to keep up with them as they fall off or the paint flakes off um, and you need to make sure that it stays legible. Uh, last piece uh, or second to last piece of equipment we're going to talk about is uh, as we uh, again move from the anchor uh, back to the boat is going to be the windlass. Uh, some things that you really want to spend a lot of money on when you're gearing your boat up for cruising uh, and just in general uh, is going to be good motor and a good windlass among obviously many others but talk about two things that are a real headache that they fail on a regular basis going to be those two so windlass uh, we have a uh, nice uh, nice quick uh, there's horizontal there's vertical there's different types uh, most boats are going to come with one that was hopefully sized and decently, works decently well for that boat. If not, you can do your homework and figure out which one works the best. Um, they take a lot of power. Uh, so if you're going with a powered windlass, and uh, I would strongly suggest you do that if you're gonna be anchoring more than uh, once a month or so, because manually pulling up an anchor and chain is a real nightmare. So uh, they take a lot of power, so you have to keep that in mind. Uh, if you are putting a system in for the first time, you're gonna need some big wire runs going up. Um, but Having that power and having that on the windlass and having it all well installed uh, with a thermal breaker is going to be an absolute lifesaver. It's going to save your back and uh, it's going to save your hands and it's going to save you a lot of time and a lot of grief. So moving down into the uh, last thing we're going to talk about is uh, moving down into the uh, very far end of the chain through the windlass. Um, oh, actually before we leave the windlass, uh, controls. So again, a lot of boats are gonna come with different controls. Relatively standard to have uh, two different foot controls, one for up, one for down. So we have ours on two different sides of the boat. Uh, a lot of times people put them over on one side so you can control uh, from the same side. It's all personal preference. Uh, but a uh, major pro tip is if your windlass does not have a chain counter slash remote uh, operating switch in the cockpit which again a lot of the new boats do or if you buy a new windlass you can have that option it's a fancy schmancy display with arrows and it'll count your chain for you and it costs a bunch of money um, if you want to go simple um, we'll uh, show a shot of what we have it's just a simple three position instantaneous switch so it's going to go down and it's going to go up and that allows you to drop the anchor from the cockpit and that is an absolute life changer and game changer if you are single handing short handing and even if you're not doing all those it's a super tiny little switch but having that option if you end up having if you're trying to drop anchor and the person who's normally dropping has to run back really quickly to do something instead of now where they're having nobody up there no way to drop it now all you have to do is hit that button and drop it down um, if you don't have a chain counter, hopefully you have a cockpit that allows you to see the bow roller and then you can watch those colored tags drop off the front to see how much chain you have on. So now we're going to uh, move on to talking about uh, the actual anchoring techniques. First we're going to talk about basic techniques and then we're going to talk about, oh no, I lied, one more piece of equipment, snubbers. Snubbers, 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 super important. Um, had a super funny experience in uh, Annapolis when uh, some guy on a who knows what uh, old old powerboat uh, came by us and said, "Man, it looks like you guys are real pros. You know what you're doing. You got that rope that connects your anchor to the boat." Apparently, he was really impressed by our snubber. So, a uh, couple different kinds of snubber. Uh, we have two on board. We have just a uh, simple single leg snubber so this is a uh, production chain hook that you can get that goes around uh, the whatever size chain you have uh, you can use snap shackles you can use soft shackles you can use 
tons of different connections. Uh, this is just a simple one, so use this if we're in lighter conditions, we're anchored for a shorter amount of time. Um, this is just obviously gonna go on a single cleat. Uh, we'll show a picture of what it looks like when it's deployed. And then the other one that uh, you can just see the uh, eyes on is uh, our bridle. So this is a double leg snubber. This is gonna be a little bit more uh, heavy duty. It's gonna provide an equalization on both sides. So it's gonna help with swinging, which uh, if you're on Sierra Wind uh, is definitely a plus. We swing around a lot for some reason. So uh, bridles are gonna be uh, a little bit more heavy duty. They're gonna equalize better. They're gonna stop you from swinging and um, they're going to uh, obviously be a little bit better in heavy, uh, heavier winds and weather. Uh, because now you have uh, two points of contact with the boat as, uh, instead of just one. So now we're done with equipment. Moving on to basic techniques. So uh, the first uh, thing to talk about and one of the most important is scope. The definition of scope is uh, how much, basically how much uh, road, which is uh, either your chain or rope, uh, how much anchor road you have out relative to the depth that you are in. 5 to 1 or 7 to 1 is a general rule of thumb uh, that people use. 5 to 1 would be for calmer weather, 7 to 1 would be for a little bit more uh, aggressive uh, conditions. Um, that being said, the amount of scope that you use is completely 100% depend, dependent on the boat that you have and on the conditions that are forecasted. I've anchored in two, with 2 to 1 scope before. You got a bunch of heavy chain and a big anchor and you're in a calm bay and there's a bunch of boats around you and you don't have a lot of swing room i've anchored with two to one before i'm not going to leave the boat and go ashore and kind of do my own thing with that i'm going to be on board paying attention making sure that everything's okay but no problem with that I've done that a bunch of times if the conditions work for it one boat i was on we would do 15 to 1 as a as just a standard we're just gonna put this out. If you got a lot of windage, if you got a small anchor, if you got a light chain, uh, it's gonna really depend on the boat you have and the anchor and the road you have. But like I said, five to seven to one, eh, kind, of a, kind of a standard to start from, uh, we'll say that. So uh, besides the scope uh, and your, uh, your ground tackle, which is another name for the whole setup of your anchor, uh, another really important thing to consider when you're dropping anchor is what the bottom is made out of. Uh, so we're in a really great anchorage right now. Uh, it's all sand. Sand for our anchor works really great. That's another thing to pay attention to when you're uh, choosing your uh, type of anchor. Our backup anchor is our Danforths. Danforths are bomber in certain conditions, in certain uh, types of bottom compositions. Sand, mud, phenomenal. They will not move unless you start wiggling around too much. We had a, our stern anchor, which is obviously a lot smaller, hold us in 40 knots in a storm in Mexico. Uh, it wasn't supposed to, but it did it great because it's a Danforth, it's in sand, and it was set well. That's what it's supposed to do. Um, but if uh, you have a Danforth and you try to set it on some rocks, it might not work so well. Uh, so knowing what your bottom is is going to be super important in uh, determining what anchor you decide to get and also uh, how much scope you're going to put out and where you're going to anchor. Obviously, if there's a big patch of rock over in a certain area or seagrass uh, or coral, this, uh, this, that's our current headache, is, uh, is a coral, it's going to be a lot uh, better to just go a little bit over to the side and uh, find a nice patch of sand and drop in that. Uh, not always an option and we're gonna get to uh, talking about that a little bit later, but if you can, it's gonna be a lot better to uh, drop in a nice clean sand, mud, uh, gravel, whatever the, uh, whatever the best holding is going to be for your anchor in that area. Um, other considerations when you are talking about uh, where to anchor is going to be uh, how many boats there are uh, and what else is around you. So uh, we're in a pretty wide open anchorage right now. We got other boats, but it's pretty it's a pretty decent sized space here so nobody has to get super close if you try to pull into block island on fourth of july uh or annapolis harbor to watch the fireworks there's going to be six thousand schmucks on boats who've never anchored before all trying to get space in there uh and even if you're not there even if you're just in a smaller anchorage uh, with a bunch of cruisers that you hope know how to anchor uh it's a big consideration because not only do you now have to worry about where you drop and set and how you're going to swing but you have to worry about how they're going to swing 
and you have to worry about how much scope they have out because their scope is going to dictate their swing and where you guys are all going to go. Different boats swing in different ways. 140 foot motor yacht is going to sit just a little bit different than the Uchimura over there and they're going to sit a little bit different than we are depending on the winds and the currents. So you really have to pay attention to the other boats that are around you uh, as well as uh, their ground tackle, their situation, and where you are. In addition to boats, you want to pay attention to underwater obstructions. So charts are obviously great to have on board. You should be looking at those when you're uh, pulling up into the anchorage. And you should know that just because it looks like there's a nice big empty patch over there, maybe there's a reef over there. Maybe there's a big rock under there. Maybe there's a reason that other boats aren't going in that area. So make sure you are aware of the bottom composition and also underwater obstructions as well as the other boats uh, that are around you. Just some etiquette things. Um, generally, the person that has their anchor down first, so whoever is there first kind of has like the, the right of way, so to speak. So if you're anchored somewhere and somebody comes in the anchor super close to you, it's the boat that just dropped near you that's been there less time that is gonna have to move and kind of fix the problem that they created. Uh, just a little footnote. So, uh, other things to consider when looking at other boats when you're deciding to anchor is, is everybody bow anchored or are some people stern anchored? Uh, because that again is going to drastically dictate uh, how you're going to position yourself. If the whole anchorage is bow anchored um, only, it could be that it's a nice calm anchorage and uh, you can just go ahead and drop that bow. Um, or it could be that I've been in certain ones where people just don't know how to use stern anchors and you can just kind of tuck over in a corner, set a stern anchor and you're gonna be a lot more comfortable. Uh, but generally, if uh, you're gonna kind of change the anchoring paradigm, make sure that you're not interfering with other people who are there before you uh, and in their swing room. So you've got that. And then the last, uh, last things to consider are going to be uh, your current and pretty conditions. So wind and current are going to be obviously the things that dictate this the most. Uh, your wind is going to dictate how you're going to swing and where you're going to move. Uh, you can't just go up and drop your anchor on the beach and back onto it into um, say 30 feet of water if there's a forecasted 180 degree shift in the wind because you're going to wind up on the beach. Uh, sometimes you can if you're feeling confident you can if you're sure the wind isn't going to change you can go up really shallow you can back back uh, i use a safety anchor if i do that we'll talk about that later but uh the wind is going to dictate your swing uh and it's also going to dictate the fetch so depending on the anchorage what uh what your protection is what, how exposed you are from different areas uh you want to take that into account when choosing say which side of the bay to go in uh, you want to be in the most sheltered area for your current and predicted conditions and uh, last thing is current. If you're gonna be anchoring anywhere with current, uh, a lot of people on the East Coast anchoring in the, in the uh, intercoastal waterway, uh, current makes a massive difference. So again, you can't be anchored when the current's coming on your nose, you can't go and drop right in front of a bridge and back onto it because when that tide switches, you're gonna get sucked straight out there and you're gonna be under the bridge. With or without a mass, that's usually not a good place to be. So now moving on to the actual physical mechanics of uh, dropping your anchor. We're going to talk about your uh, your basic uh, single anchor and then we're going to go into some more advanced things. So once you have selected your spot, uh, if you're not sure uh, in choosing your spot, you can always drive around, get a sense of the depth profile, make sure it matches your chart. Uh, it's going to be time to drop your anchor. So. Uh, whether you're single-handed or double-handed, uh, whether you have windless controls in the bow only, the stern, you know, in the cockpit, it's gonna make a big difference, obviously, how you're going to do it, but the core tenants are the same. What you're going to do is you're going to come up to your spot, you're going to drop your anchor, and once you have the amount of scope out that is equal to your depth, you're going to slowly start drifting back. So whether you need to use a motor for that or whether or not the wind's just gonna take you and it's gonna set you back, uh, whether or not you have to use the motor to bump forward so you don't go too fast is gonna all depend on your conditions at the time. But you get the anchor down, literally just the anchor laying on the ground and then once you're in say we're in 15 feet of water once we got 15 feet out I'm gonna start that slow movement so that I'm laying chain back in the direction that I want to be going um, depending on the boat that you have is gonna dictate whether you're going to uh, actually drive it back on cast typically I drive back because you've got twin screws or motor yachts typically you can 
you drive them back and you stay in line, um, especially catamarans because they put windlasses further aft and you don't want the chain to scratch your hulls if you go beam two. Uh, but this boat and uh, a lot of other boats, uh, you can just give a little bump, uh, prop walk it over or give a, with a twin screw, you can uh, just give one little bump back, get yourself uh, kind of going sideways a little, little bit, uh, beam to the wind. The wind's gonna push you back, you're gonna lay your chain out the way you want, and then once you are at whatever depth uh, and you have as much scope out as you want, uh, you're gonna stop, and uh, if you're sideways to the wind, uh, it's kind of nice because you can, you, uh, you use the resistance from that wind and that little bit of inertia that you've built up to very gently start the process of setting you, which is then in turn going to bring your bow into the wind. So if you're shorthanded, uh, or even if you're not, that's a good way to uh, kind of get that indicator that you've now maxed your, your scope out, you're, at, you're fully extended, and now the anchor is starting to dig and starting to set, and you can tell that because you're now nose to the wind. Uh, after you do that, uh, you're going to want to set your anchor. Uh, setting your anchor again is going to, uh, how you do that is going to depend on your boat uh, and on your ground tackle setup. Uh, but essentially it's going to uh, entail using your motor to put a little bit of gentle back pressure um, on that anchor to make sure that it's digging in, that you're setting, that you're not dragging and you're not skipping. Uh, while you do that, again, depends on the boat, depends on the setup, but a lot of times you're gonna be up, either you or somebody else is gonna be up here and you're gonna have a hand, have a foot on the chain and you're gonna feel for vibrations. Um, there's a little bit of risk in that. Obviously, you're touching a potentially moving piece of equipment, so you wanna be careful. Uh, if nothing else, you can just look and you can see is the chain jumping? Is it going from a nice steep angle and then is it drop, dropping down and then steep and then dropping? That's a sign that you're dragging. So you're gonna be applying pressure with the motor and you're gonna be setting that anchor. Uh, if you're on a big uh, powerboat, um, you might only need to go idle uh, in reverse with uh, depending on how much torque and how much power you have in the motors. If you're on a little sailboat with a 20 horse uh, diesel, you might need to max that thing out in reverse if you're expecting a strong blow uh, to get that anchor set. And how, and again, this is, this is a personal opinion, but uh, how you set your anchor should be dependent on the conditions that are forecasted. Um, if you're in a place that's prone to thunderstorms, even if it's nice out, you might want to really set that anchor and make sure that you got a really good hold um, before you uh, go ahead and snub and move out your day because you may have a big change in conditions. If you're somewhere with very consistent conditions or you're only going to be anchored for a very short amount of time with that two to one scope, I'm not going to be hammering back in reverse because I'm only going to be there. I'm on a two hour charter and one of those hours is going to be on the hook. I'm going to be on board. I don't want to be hammering it down in reverse to try to really set my anchor because it doesn't matter that much. I want to be on board, it's light conditions, I don't need to go through that trouble. But uh, one way or the other, depending on the conditions, you got to set it and then after you're set you're going to snub it. Um, so you don't want to leave the boat just sitting on the windlass. The windlass is designed to raise and lower your anchor, it's not designed to hold the weight of your boat. Basic anchor in consideration before we move on to, uh, to other stuff. Once you're snub and once you're set, um, you want to use a, uh, you want to get some sort of anchor alarm. Um, some sort of electronic uh, methodology to make sure that you're not dragging to confirm what you physically see and hear with the anchor. So uh, I've got two apps that I use. Um, one of them is going to be Anchor Alarm. We've got the Pro Edition. This one's super nice because it's the yeah. best visual representation <laughs> of, uh, oh, we'll put a screenshot up there. Uh, it just gives you a really good visual representation. It allows you to increase and expand uh, the radius. Uh, you can do a late set, you can do a immediate set. Um, it's got a super loud and obnoxious alarm. It has a low GPS accuracy alarm. So really great uh, one that I use in conjunction with uh, pretty much any of my other navigation software, even when I'm working on big boats. Um, and another one that's great, uh, Time Zero, TZ Boat, Time Zero Boat has a function where you can mirror your uh, anchor alarm from the chart plotter or computer to your phone or iPad. So if you leave the boat, you can actually monitor remotely from there. Uh, but Time Zero is a bit of an expensive setup. Uh, so if not that, then another one is uh, just straight anchor alarm. This one again allows you to pair a sender and a receiver 
and uh, it'll allow you to do uh, a lot of the same functions as the other one. I wouldn't say it's quite as sexy a package, um, but it allows you to remotely monitor that, which is fantastic. It does need cell service. Uh, if you have an onboard router, be it satellite or otherwise, um, you can head off to the boat, and as long as you got service on your phone, you can check and you can say, yep, boat's sitting exactly where I left it, or like, oh, swung around a bunch, or if you get an anchor alarm on your phone, you say, oh, we might be dragging, and then you can know to head back to the boat as soon as you can. So uh, setting anchor alarms, and uh, last thing is going to be diving your anchor. Um, depending on the water depth and quality, uh, that's gonna be either a hard yes or maybe a hard no. Here in the Tomotos, we love diving the anchor because as soon as you get where you're going, you wanna get in the water, you wanna get snorkeling, you put your gear on, you go and you go inspect it. Uh, so diving your anchor is a great visual way, obviously. It's the only 100% way to make sure that your anchor is properly set and make sure that it's not gonna drag onto or off of any obstructions. And uh, last uh, kind of general one, we're gonna talk about uh, how to recover the anchor. Um, the, uh, really, we're just gonna talk about one thing, which is that you drive the boat to the anchor. You do not pull the boat with the windlass. We were talking about this a little bit before, but this is designed to raise and lower the anchor. It is not designed to pull your 10, 20, 30, 100, 200, 300 ton uh, boat. So make sure that you're driving your boat to the anchor and lifting the anchor up with the windlass. Um, as you're doing that, if you have the ability, give the anchor road a rinse and the anchor itself. If you've got a big water maker and you got a freshwater deck rinse, um, go ahead and give that guy a rinse down. Your chain is going to thank you and you're going to thank yourself uh, when you don't have to regalvanize it nearly as often. You can tell from the staining on the gel coat, it's about time for us to do that here. And uh, that's kind of your basics. So now we're gonna go to uh, stern anchors, uh, our intermediate anchoring uh, techniques. So stern anchors are an absolute uh, lifesaver in so many different conditions. Um, let's actually take a walk and go see ours. Okay, so uh, now I'm talking stern anchors. Uh, we're here at the uh, back of the boat. Stern anchors are phenomenal, but unfortunately they are uh, very much uh, subject to the uh, size and displacement of your boat. Uh, we're on a little 11 meter, uh, displaced uh, just over 10 tons, so we can have a nice little, uh, what do I, I think this guy's a, is a 20 pound Danforth, and uh, all of our road is in this bag. Uh, we've got 25 feet of chain on that, and then it goes to a three strand uh, uh, splice over to nylon. That's not a problem because we don't have a windlass back here. We just go directly to a cleat or through our stern bow roller. Um, but if you're on a 75, if you're on a big, if you're on a big boat, um, you could potentially run into the issue that your stern anchor is so large and ungainly uh, that it's kind of prohibitive uh, to really use that on a regular basis. There are some things you can do to mitigate that. Uh, you can do rail mounts. Uh, this is a kind of a, a stowed rail mount um, where we have to actually disc pull it off of the mount, connect it to the road, and then deploy it. Again, it's easy, it's fast for us. Uh, but if you've got a boat that is a little bit bigger and you don't want to be doing that every time, then maybe you have a quick release mount that you can just deploy it straight off and you actually have a stern roller with a uh, stern chain locker uh, to be able to use that. Some boats even uh, have windlasses on the stern. Um, I would say that's a very big minority. So uh, normally I would say uh, look for something that's going to be large enough that it's going to work for your boat. Um, Mantis is a is a great um, is a great anchor because they stow down really small. Or sorry, Fortress um, Fortress anchors stow down really small. They're light, so you can get a giant Fortress anchor for a pretty big size boat, uh, and you can utilize that on the stern uh, with your uh, road. However, you have that packaged. You saw our setup back there. Uh, one of the things with the stern anchor is that it's really important to have it in a place that's going to be accessible and is as easy to use at a time. Because essentially your stern anchor, I would say it's primarily going to be used to get you more comfortable in an anchorage. Uh, there are definitely gonna be times where it's mandatory uh, for you to do that. But I like in Mexico, huge amount of times where you go into these anchorages 
and people are just flopping around rail to rail because they're beamed to the swell because there's light winds and it's just absolute hell on board for them. And if you go there, drop a stern anchor and equalize onto it into the swell, uh, you're going to be super comfortable and you're going to be riding really nicely uh, pitching instead of rolling. Um, but if your stern anchor is buried and the road is hard to get to and it's heavy and it's just not conveniently set up, uh, you're going to be less likely to use it and what's the point of having something if you're not using it. So make sure you're setting up your, uh, your gear in a way that's going to be the most accessible and the easiest to use. So now we're going to talk about setting a stern anchor. There's two ways to do it essentially. The first is going to be to drop one anchor first over scope that one, drop your other anchor, and then equalize between them, or you set it with the ding. So the first way uh, is gonna be easier in a lot of ways. Uh, typically what we do is we'll, uh, we'll go up, we'll drive over the site that I want the stern anchor, we'll drop the stern anchor, we'll drive up until the stern anchor road is maxed out. We have about 250 feet of, uh, of road on there. We'll drop the bow anchor, and then we'll get to the point that we're equalized between the two by pulling back on the stern anchor and by using the motor to drift back and setting just like we would normally. So what that does is that allows you to set it without having to deploy a tender, without having to do anything. If you're in a big rolly anchorage, uh, it's a lot easier to uh, do it that way than to get there. And this is option two, which is gonna be to get there, Drop the hook like normal, deploy your tender, or I guess if you're on a really small boat, paddle board, swim it out, whatever, um, and then stretch that stern anchor road out to wherever you want it, drop it, and then tighten that stern over. Um, that's gonna be a lot more work because a lot of times the boat's gonna be swinging and it might not have you lined up perfectly into the swell, or if there's an obstruction that you're trying to avoid, you might end up drifting towards that obstruction in the time that it takes you to do that. So I'd say generally, if possible, uh, we try to do the driving method, uh, which is just a little bit less work. Um, something to keep in mind though is, uh, is how much scope you have on your stern anchor. So when you're setting it up, you wanna keep that in mind that if you don't have enough scope on that, you might only need to scope out three to one on your stern anchor, but if you can't set it with a five to one and back to a three to one, you might not have enough road on that stern anchor. Uh, so, the reverse of uh, deploying a stern anchor uh, works great for picking it up. You can either, uh, say, deploy your bow anchor, deploy extra road on that, pull yourself back and lift the, uh, lift the anchor out like that, or you can get in your tender and you can go out, pull it up, uh, break, the, uh, break the anchor off the bottom, and then pull it back into the boat. So that's your basic stern anchor setup. Now, uh, we're going to talk about using stern anchor as a safety. So uh, I mentioned it briefly before. Uh, there are some times where you're in an anchorage. Um, uh, this is a technique that I like to use on occasion, uh, especially in the two motos where the sand patches are a little bit smaller. Say we have a really nice sand patch over here, but there's really only enough space for me to be you know, lined up, say, east to west in it. I can't really afford to swing around a whole 180 degrees if there's a wind shift or a squall or the current, something like that. Um, if it's something that I'm relatively concerned that there's gonna be a, a change of conditions that actually is gonna make me swing like that, then I'll go ahead and just deploy the stern anchor like we talked about. But if it's something that I'm pretty sure is not going to happen, but the consequences, if it were to happen, are significant enough, like going up on a beach or dragging into a rock or something, uh, that I really want to avoid that, what I'll do is I'll set the stern anchor as a backup. Uh, it's a lot easier to set it as a backup. You don't have to kind of worry about the, you know, actually setting the stern anchor and engaging it and making sure it's going to hold the full weight of the boat as well because it's more of a contingency plan. So what you do with that is you get your main anchor set and then typically I'll just swim mine out because it's light enough but again you can use the tender or you could back onto it if you want and uh, you're going to get the stern anchor set where you want. You want to make sure obviously it's in nice clean sand whatever it is uh, the area you're dropping in and you're gonna lay your chain out. Again, I'd suggest having at least some chain on there uh, for that holding uh, and for that shape protection. Um, but you wanna lay that You wanna lay that out and then we buoy uh, the rest of the road up. So 
will set a buoy so that it's the anchors on the bottom, the chains on the bottom, and then there's a nice gentle rise up to a buoy, and then we'll have as much slack as we want to allow us to swing and have that freedom to move just a little bit kind of naturally on the bow anchor without actually uh, risking us going further than we want, uh, say going up onto the beach if there's a wind shift, because if we do drift that far, then as that as we keep as we drift over, that road is now going to engage and become tight. That buoy is going to usually get submerged and pulled down to the bottom, and now that stern anchor is engaged for whatever those conditions are that have changed. And then you hope that they change right back, uh, and it does its job, and you can go back to your normal thing. If it looks like it's not going to change, you may want to consider checking that stern anchor uh, or possibly relocating the boat because now your safety anchor that you didn't necessarily plan on taking the full load of the boat overnight say is now doing exactly that so that's your stern anchor as a safety uh definitely a good skill set to have um next up is going to be some more advanced anchoring um so we're going to talk about uh two different kind of categories. The first is going to be floats, and this is going to be very specific to uh, coral heavy areas, uh, but definitely good to know. And the second is going to be a uh, triple anchor or uh, a secondary bow. So um, floats uh, are fantastic if you have very small patches of sand to drop in and uh, not much else that you can do uh, as far as good holding on the bottom. So a lot of these anchorages in the Tumotos and the other islands here, um, you have a ton of really beautiful coral that you don't want to jack up. So what you do is you float your chain off the bottom. You still have some chain on the bottom because the chain provides a lot of the holding for the anchor, so you can't just do a one-to-one -one scope and call it a day. Uh, normally what we'll do is we'll do, this is a double float, and we'll have a picture of this in action. If we're in 15 feet of water, we're gonna set our first uh, set of floats, which is going to be a double float because it's going to take the most weight. We're going to set our first set of floats at uh, twice our depth, so two to one scope. So we'll go ahead and tie that off at 30. Then we're going to back down and typically you go at one to one scope uh, after that. So if you're in 15 feet, your first one is 30, your next one is going to be 45, 60, 75, uh, and so on. So the first one we have is double. Uh, as a double float, they're two spliced onto one, and then after that, we have individual floats that we use for the next two. Uh, if you need to, uh, you can use fenders. Ours aren't quite buoyant enough to really work super well. If you've got the big giant ball fenders, they work pretty good. Um, so whatever you use for floats is gonna depend, but that's a great uh, technique to use if you wanna keep the chain off the bottom and uh, not damage the coral that you're on or uh, whatever other surface. In New England, they've got some uh, areas that have protected seagrass, uh, so you wanna be careful of those. Um, and it's also good because then you don't wrap your chain around big gnarly things that are really hard to get your chain out. A lot of people do a lot of damage to their boats, but when they're wrapped up, they try to pull the chain up. And if you're in a rough anchorage and you tighten your windlass down and you get a swell that lifts you up, you can actually break your roller, your windlass, you can do a lot of damage there. So the chain floats mitigate that problem by keeping you from pulling off the bottom. Um, if it's a really gnarly spot, um, you might need to use, and this might, uh, this is good not only for, uh, in conjunction with chain floats, but also by itself, you may want to use a trip line on the anchor. So, Rocknas have uh, the nice big arch. Uh, some places just have a little eye that you can uh, carabiner or a, uh, a line to. But a trip line is really good if you're in rocky areas or places where you're concerned about being able to get the anchor back up that it's not going to get stuck. Uh, trip lines are great because the, you can drive up to them, grab them with the boat hook, and you can actually pull the anchor not from the place that it's designed to take the load and to dig deeper, which is the shank there, but you're actually pulling from the front of the anchor, which is going to be its weakest point, so that's going to break its connection on the bottom a lot easier. So uh, trip lines are good to use both by themselves and also in conjunction uh, with floats. Um, and now really quick, a uh, couple of uh, different ways to use a uh, secondary bow or just a tertiary anchor. So again, we have ours in, uh, we have our road in a bag here and we have our secondary uh, bow anchor there. You can see it's a lot bigger than uh, 
You can see it's a lot bigger than our stern anchor. Again, Danforth, because it's nice, it stows in these rail mounts, it's out of the way, it's unobtrusive, um, but it's still easy to deploy. So, um, common ways to uh, deploy a, uh, a tertiary anchor or, or a secondary bow is gonna be in uh, a Y shape. So you're gonna set your, uh, your two anchors out in a Y. If you're concerned about swinging into something over there, you could either set the stern or you could set one anchor in your primary location and another anchor over in the opposite direction to prevent yourself from swinging over into that item. Uh, that only works obviously if the rest of your swinging radius is clear and you need to be careful about the two tangling. But doing a Y uh, off the bow is a uh, very good tactic for avoiding obstructions and uh, it can also work in some areas we'll talk very briefly at the end about storm tactics. Um, Another way to use a tertiary anchor uh, that we've used, this gets, this is getting uh, a little bit more complicated, is to uh, kind of catch yourself in a certain direction uh, if you're bow and stern anchors. So we've been in, uh, we've been in anchorages before that are super tight and we're bow and stern anchored to keep ourselves from swinging into the rocks on either side but because of either the way that the uh, current is moving or the wind, that we're getting shoved towards a certain side. And when you load up a balanced stern anchor uh, perpendicular to their direction of set, uh, that's obviously going to be uh, just mechanical advantage, it says that's going to exert a lot more force on them. Um, so we would actually take our uh, tertiary anchor out straight off the beam or potentially off the bow depending on how much space and what the conditions are. We're going to take that off to the side, drop it, set it, and then take it back to either a midship's cleat or to the bow or to a winch. Um, and that's going to be our insurance against if a big gust or uh, the current really kicks and it takes us uh, closer to that obstruction that our bow or stern anchor isn't going to give out and is and let us swing into that that's kind of just our insurance um you can also uh i mentioned kedging you can also use a use a tertiary uh anchor to uh to kind of kedge yourself off of an obstruction if you do get stuck kedging is where you uh set a uh, set an anchor out way far away and then actually winch yourself onto that um, people do that uh, from the top of the mast with a halyard sometimes to get their keel broken free of an obstruction or just uh, off of a cleat if you're just kind of on a little sandbank. So that can be a useful, uh, just useful way to uh, utilize your uh, tertiary anchor if you have one. Again, if possible, more better. More anchors, more options, better you're going to be and uh, more safe you can potentially be. Last things. Um, Super quick is going to be talking storm tactics in med mooring. So, uh, storm tactics uh, is going to be you know if you can't get a dock or a mooring or get on the hard for a big blow uh, is going to be how you're going to keep your boat safe in case of a uh, a big whether it's a big or a little system that you're concerned about. So, um, I mentioned the Y uh, anchor. If you uh, have the fetch and the wind in a direction that is not going to necessarily swing 360 degrees, uh, that can work very well. The Y anchor gets a little bit less uh, safe when you're worried about a 180 degree shift because if you don't scope out and place both anchors at the correct location, as you swing over one, your chain can from, the, from one of your anchors can actually foul the second one. Uh, but if you're not necessarily worried about that shift or you're confident in your ability to set it so that's not going to happen, that can be a good tactic for storms. Another one uh, that we want to talk about is uh, setting, uh, it's a, you know, it's an anchor on an anchor essentially. So um, what that entails is setting your secondary anchor off the front of your bow anchor. So you're going to drop that backup anchor in front, you're going to back on, you're going to lay that usually a small amount of chain or road is sufficient only you know 5 10 15 feet and then you're going to lay your primary after that and then you're going to scope out as far as you possibly can for all storm tactics depending on your surroundings it's always going to be maximum scope possible because the more scope you have out the more holding power the more shock absorbing power you're going to have so if you put an anchor on your anchor then you're now increasing the security of that of your main um, by providing it with a uh, 
with an anchor of its own. Um, pros and cons of the of the double anchor versus that. Uh, we talked about the uh, the first one. The con of the uh, what we just talked about the anchor on an anchor is that you are still on a single point of failure. Uh, so if your main road goes, uh, your wind, you know, like whatever it is, you uh, you're on a single point of failure for that. So with storms, more anchors better. Uh, you know, if you're in somewhere with mangroves, uh, people run. I mean, literally full throttle, run into the mangroves and spider off, tie as many lines as you can uh, into those trees plus your anchors. So there's a lot of different ways of. Uh, of doing that and what you do is going to depend on the storm, the situation, your boat, and the conditions that are anticipated. Um, last thing to wrap up, I think our longest video to date, is going to be med mooring. Med mooring is uh, another time that that cockpit switch uh, for you to deploy is going to be an absolute lifesaver because uh, med mooring is going to be where you are stern to a pier or a dock. And uh, the anchoring principles are the same. Uh, you're gonna scope out appropriate for your depth. You're gonna drop that anchor. And then instead of, you can't do the drift that we talked about before, this one you have to keep lined up. And if you're on a single screw sailboat, you best be on your rudder. Uh, hopefully you got some thrusters. But you're gonna stay lined up. You're gonna come back to the pier and you're going to throw your two lines. Ideally, you want to have two stern lines and two spring lines um, going. The springs are going to go wider out. The sterns are going to go back. Sometimes you'll even crisscross depending on the size of the boat. Um, but you're going to scope out the same way. You're going to back up. You're going to get those lines on and then you're going to equalize with your anchor so that you're putting just enough gentle pressure on your stern lines and spring lines, the lines going to the dock, that it keeps you the distance that you want away from the uh, pier or the dock. You want to make sure that you are enough that if there's a big gust or a change in current that the anchor road isn't going to come up or potentially drag a little bit and send you back into the pier but you also don't usually want to be too over tightened so that you can't get the boat uh, back to the pier to disembark or re-embark or get your passerelle or plank all the way back uh, to the pier. So that has been uh, a not so short explanation on uh, some things you might want to know about anchoring. We'll catch you next time.